Okay, good evening, my beloved Broccolini. How are you? Good to see you. It's Tad. It is Sunday. It is one minute after 7 p.m. here on the west coast of California, that golden land of sunshine and whatever the hell else that we're supposed to have out here. Sunshine and socialism. <laughs> or whatever. Um, anyway, good to see you all. And uh, sorry that took a bit of a moment there. Um, always odd and interesting seeing all the strange things that can happen when you're trying to post things on another Facebook page while you've got a Facebook page open. But that is beyond and beside. So we will not waste any more time on that. Um, again, a pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining me. I will be reading in just a few minutes. Um, trying to think about what actually had a fairly relaxed weekend um, in deference to my um, sore wrists. Uh, haven't been doing much actual typing this weekend. Um, Deb and I went out to uh, the Stanford, well, it used to be called the Stanford Museum. Now it's the Cantor Art Museum, Arts Museum uh, in Palo Alto, which is over the hill from us. And I uh, had a lovely day wandering around. <laughs> the cry of the dog. I don't know if you can hear that through the microphone there. Um, anyway, uh, we had a, a very nice time and looking at art things of all sorts. Um, some uh, amazing pictures. Uh, Frank Stella that we're, we were still talking about last night. A uh, huge Frank Stella painting. And uh, some wonderful Gordon Parks photography and just all kinds of cool stuff. It was really nice to get out of the house. It was really nice to look at some art. We went to um, a restaurant that we haven't been to for many, many years. It used to be a family favorite when we lived on that side of the hill. Um, so it was a kind of an exercise in nostalgia. Nostalgia and arroz con pollo, which are two of my favorite things. <coughs> anyway, um, so I am... Uh, we had a lot of problems with the sound last night. I'm trying it with my old microphone tonight. Uh, but I'm also moving some other things around, so let me know if there's a problem with the sound. I don't think there's anything I can do about it, but I am trying some different things just to see, because people told me we were crackly and scratchy. This, of course, did not take into account the distinct possibility that the crackly and scratchy thing is actually me, because I certainly am getting more crackly and scratchy with each, as with each day that goes past. However, um, as I said, I've made some changes, uh, some things that I hope will work better. And let me know if there's a problem. You don't have to let me know if everything's okay. But if there's a problem or if the sound seems weird or whatever, just go ahead. Drop me a, a, a hello. Um, other than that, anything what else to talk about? Um, just the usual stuff. Working on the book, of course, um, which is healthy and fun to be back working on the book with, you know, real work. Um, it's always important. And uh, I have had to put the last part of Navigator's Children away for so long um, that it's a huge, huge pleasure to, um, to uh, actually get a chance to work with, you know, the, the, the actual writing as compared to all the other stuff I've been doing, which has been editing and mental work and, you know, all these kinds of things that had to be done because of chopping the book in half and because of writing Brothers of the Wind and having to get that ready for publication in between and all kinds of other things. So it is all a good um, thing. So no complaints there. I'm enjoying being back to work on the book again. Busily killing off all your favorite characters. Yes, every single... That's that's my, my news flash for the day. Every single main character is going to die. Um, but, of course, 
every single one of us is going to die. So it's not as much of a news flash. Uh, will they die in the book, though? You see, haha, that is the question. No, probably most of them will not die during the book, although you never can tell. You never can tell. That's one thing. But um, about writers is that sometimes we just wake up, we're having a bad day, the dog starts barking early in the morning, you know, the hot water's not working properly or whatever, and it's like, I'm going to go kill a character, you know, and I know you always suspected that was how it worked, you know, that we were just truly arbitrary, selfish, small-minded little people, we writers. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. That is so true. And uh, so if everybody's nice to me tonight, maybe I won't kill the two or three characters I was planning to kill tomorrow. Because I was thinking, you know, God, I got way too many trolls in this book. You know, way too many trolls. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, it, George proved it. George R.R. R. Martin proved it. You know, it, when in doubt, kill somebody. Kill somebody violently and unpleasantly. Um, revenge killing is particularly good. So, you know, I, I, how can I ignore a message like that? You know, George's books have become a cultural touchstone. I am still laboring in the back alleys of, uh, of relative un, unknownness, <laughs> whatever that word would be, unknowledge. Anyway, um, so I'm going to be killing off a buttload of characters in a buttload of different ways. You, you just watch and see. Um, anything else <laughs> after that strange little rant? Um, no, 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 I don't think so. That's really pretty much it. I don't have a huge amount to say this week. Um, I've just got stuff to do and we're getting near the end of the book where all kinds of action-y stuff starts to happen. So this would probably be a fairly good time to start reading. Um, also, uh, but first I had to say hello to people, see who's here, who has checked in. Now I'm assuming oftentimes there are other people that haven't checked in, but let me at least say hello to the ones who have been kind and polite enough. See, even as I said that, somebody dropped off the feed. <laughs> I scared him away. Uh, anyway, Kelly, hello, good evening, good to see you. Claudia, a pleasure, hi. Becca, yay, good to see you. Jill, hello, hello. Are we coinciding again or is your grammar off? God, I, I don't know, are we coinciding? I'm not even sure how we're coinciding here or if we are coinciding or if in fact coincision is a legitimate thing for a married man like me to do. Um, Ray, greetings to you. Good to see you. Emily, hello. Tim, greetings, greetings. And I did have a pretty good week and a good weekend. And I hope the one coming up is even better. Yeah, absolutely. I'm in favor of that. Medardo, hello, hello. Just arriving home from travel. Good, excellent. I'm very glad that you're back safely, and I hope your family is all, or that your family and friends are all happy to see you, and that you are settled in, and in good shape. Um, let me see who else. Kristen, hello, Kristen. Very faithful re uh, reader. Uh, well, that too, but faithful listener to the reading broadcast. As always, good to hear from you. I hope our sound is better for you tonight. Jared, hello, hello. The rest of the Beale Williams clan are well, in fact, so far, as far as I know. Although, of course, that dog barking upstairs might have been the pizza showing up, which is what tends to happen on Sundays while I'm doing my reading. But it could also have been an attack by one of our big dog Johnny's many nemeses, which is the plural of nemesis. Um, Johnny has uh, equal hatred for all the enemies of human and dog kind, namely night bunnies, murder squirrels, burglars, and trucks. So if any one of those things is here, Johnny could have bravely gone out to face it, have been overwhelmed by the forces of evil, and my whole family could have been dispatched already. But I won't find out till after I finish tonight's reading. So I'll, I'll let you know. So that was Jared. Hello, Jared. Jeremy, hello. Life is still kind of weird, but so it goes. Well, I'm sorry to hear life is still kind of weird. Um, although life is always kind of weird, but you may be talking about a different kind of weird. Um, and last, ba -ba 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 -bum. yeah, it could be a performance issue. I have no idea. I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm using what is now, Jesus, I don't know, probably a 10, 11, 12 year old laptop. Cause as I mentioned last night, I, I gave Deb my new laptop because she at the time was working only on laptop and I was still using uh, something else. 
but now I am also working only on laptops and um, I, I inherited her old laptop. So it could indeed be that it's time for me to start thinking about a new computer. Oh, God, there's so many things and they all cost. Um, but anyway, enough bibble babble. So anything else that needs to be mentioned? I don't think so. I think it's just time to get on with reading. What we were reading last night in the last part of uh, the Otherland first volume was that uh, Rini had come through after the death of Singh when they crossed over into Otherland at the hands of something, something that nobody quite knows what it is. We suspect, but we don't know. Um, and Rini found herself alone in the jungle, uh, a very realistic seeming jungle, but a jungle nonetheless eventually reunited with Kabu, who mysteriously found himself in his second choice sim, which because of his family connection was uh, that of a baboon because it's a family thing in, in Kabu's family. Um, but it was not his choice. He had, his choice was a kind of a normal looking sim that would be appropriate for wherever he was. Instead, he wound up a baboon, um, which neither he or Rini can actually figure out. The um, then as they were making their way through this rainforest jungle and found some kind of civilization, they began to realize things about this place. They were this simulation in which they found themselves very realistic within the Otherland network. And that was that this place was um, kind of an odd combination of things. It was nothing obvious, but it was a... Um, combination of like weird 19th and 20th century technologies and the people looked sort of vaguely maybe Central Asian or something. They couldn't quite figure out where this was supposed to be. Um, and then along the way, um, they discovered Martine who had been, also had come through, but who had been very badly affected by whatever caused it. Um, they got on a bus headed for the big city called Temaloon and as they reached it, Martine finally kind of came back to consciousness. Um, and not long after she did it, they just uh, they all discovered that the place they were coming to, the city, was in fact the golden city of both the image that Rini and Kabu and Martine saw, but also, as we know, the readers know, the same golden city that Orlando saw. So that's what has been happening. They're on the bus, they have seen Temeloon, and they have realized Temeloon is the Golden City. It took an hour to reach Temeloon, crossing a great plain full of settlements, farming villages surrounded by fields of swaying grain at first, followed by thicker concentrations of suburban housing and ever-increasing modernity shopping complexes and motorway overpasses and signs festooned with unreadable glyphs. And always the city grew larger on the horizon. Rini made her way down the aisle toward the front of the bus so she could get a better look. She slid between a pair of pierce-lipped men who were joking with the driver and hung swaying on the pole by the front door to watch a dream become reality. It seemed in some ways a thing out of a storybook the tall buildings so completely different than the tower blocks and functional skyscrapers of Durban. Some were vast stepped pyramids with gardens and hanging plants at every level. Others were filigreed towers of a type she had never seen, huge spires that nevertheless had been built to suggest piles of flowers or sheaves of grain. Others, as wildly uncategorizable as abstract sculpture, had angles and protrusions that seemed architecturally impossible. All were painted, the bright colors adding to the impression of floral profusion, but the single most common color was the flashing yellow of gold. Shining gold capped the tallest pyramids and wound in barber pole stripes up the tall towers. Some of the buildings had been plated, top to bottom, so even the darkest recesses, the most deeply gouged niches, still gleamed. It was everything the blurry, captured image salvaged in Susan's lab had suggested, and more. It was a city built by lunatics, but lunatics who had been touched by genius. As the bus jounced through the outer rings of the metropolis, the tops of the tall buildings rose out of sight above the windows. 
Rini pushed through the crowding passengers and returned to her seat, breathless. It's incredible. She could not quite sh she could not shake off what she knew to be a dangerous kind of exhilaration. I can't believe we found it. We found it. Martine had been very quiet. Still, without speaking, she reached out and took Rini's hand, pulling her thoughts in another direction. Here, in the midst of the larger miracle, was a small one. Martine, the mystery woman, the voice without a face, had become a real person. True, she was using a sim body, in the way that a puppeteer used a marionette, and she was thousands of miles away from Rini's real body, and even farther away from this purely theoretical place. But she was here. Rini could feel her, could even tell something about her real physical self. It was as though Rini had finally met a treasured childhood pen pal. Unable to express this odd happiness, she only squeezed Martine's hand. The bus stopped at last, deep in the golden-shadowed canyons of the city. Martine could now walk fairly well under her own power. She and Rini and Kabu waited impatiently for the other passengers to file out before making their way down onto the tiled floor of the bus station, a vast, hollow pyramid braced with mammoth beams which rose level upon level like a kaleidoscopic spider web. They had only a few moments to appreciate its high-ceilinged magnificence before a pair of men in dark clothing stepped in front of them. "'Excuse me,' one of them said. "'You have just come on the bus from Arakataka, yes?' Rini's mind raced, but to no useful purpose. The men wore overcoats with small ceremonial capes, and both had a look of hard-faced professionalism. Any hope that they might be particularly stern ticket-takers slipped away when she looked at the oddly ceremonial-looking clubs at their belts and their polished black helmets shaped like the heads of snarling jungle cats. Yes, we were... Then you will show me your identification, please. Helplessly, Rini patted the pockets of her jumpsuit. Martine stared into space, her expression that of someone lost in a daydream. If this show is for our benefit, you may dispense with it. Beneath the high-crowned helmet, his head appeared to be shaved. You are outsiders. We have been expecting you. He stepped forward and took Rini's arm. His partner hesitated for a moment, staring at Kabu. The monkey will come with us too, of course, the first policeman said. I am sure none of you wish to delay any further, so let us go. Please content yourself that you will be transported to the great palace with all dispatch. Those are our orders. Kabu lowered his head, then took Rini's hand and followed docilely as the policeman walked them through the station toward the doors. What are you doing with us? Rini did not feel there was much purpose in it, but she did not want to give in without trying. We haven't done anything. We were hiking in the country and got lost. I have my papers at home. The policeman threw the door open. Parked outside was a large panel truck that vented steam like a sleeping dragon. Whoops, excuse me. The second... There it is. <laughs> Let's try that one again. Parked out just outside was a large panel truck that vented steam like a sleeping dragon. The second policeman pulled open the doors at the back and helped Martine up into the shadowed interior. Please, good woman. The first policeman's voice was cold. Everything will be better if you save your questions for our masters. We have been ordered days ago to wait for you. Besides, you should be honored. The council seems to have special plans for all of you. When Rini and Kabu had been ushered inside with Martine, the door was slammed shut. There were no windows. The darkness was complete. We've been here for hours! Rini had paced the same figure eight across the small cell so many times that she was now doing it with her eyes closed as she struggled to make sense of things. All that she had seen... The jungle, the magnificent city, and now this bleak stone dungeon out of a bad horror story, swirled in front of her mind's eye, but she could make no sense of them. Why all this show? If they're going to 
hypnotize us or whatever that Kali thing tried on me before. Why not just do it? Aren't they afraid we'll just drop off line? Perhaps we cannot, said Kabu. Soon after the policeman locked them in, he had climbed to the single high window and, after ascertaining that it was covered with a metal grate sufficiently fine to prevent a medium-sized monkey slipping through, had climbed back down and squatted in the corner. He had even slept there for a while, something that Rini found inexplicably annoying. Perhaps they know something about it we do not. Do we dare try? Not yet, said Martine. It might not work. They have already proved they can manipulate our minds in ways we do not understand. And even if we can, we will have an admitted defeat. In any case, these are the people who we're looking for. Rini stopped and opened her eyes. Her friends looked up at her with what she felt sure was the near indifference of the helpless, but she herself was struggling against mounting rage. If I didn't know it already, I'd be able to guess just from the way those slick, self-satisfied policemen acted. These are the people who have tried to kill us, who did kill Dr. Van Bleek and Singh and God knows how many others, and they're as proud of themselves as can be. Arrogant bastards. It will not help to get to be angry, Martine said gently. It won't? Well, what will help? Saying we are sorry? That will never interfere with their horrible goddamn games again, so please send us back with just a warning? She balled her hands into fists and swung at the air. Shit! I am so tired of being pushed and chased and scared and and manipulated by these monsters. Rini, Martine began, don't tell me not to get angry. Your brother isn't lying in a quarantine hospital. Your brother isn't a vegetable kept alive by machines, is he? Your brother who counted on you to protect him? No, Rini, they have not hurt my family as they have yours. She realized she was crying and wiped at her eyes with the back of her hand. I'm sorry, Martine, but... The door to the cell clanked and then slid open. The same two policemen stood there, ominous black shapes in the shadowy corridor. Come along. He who is favorite above all others wants to see you. Why don't you run away? Rini whispered fiercely. You could hide somewhere and then help break us out. I can't believe you're not even going to try. Kabu's look, even filtered through the baboon countenance, was pained. I would not leave you, knowing as little as we do about this place. Besides, if it is our minds they seek to affect, then we are stronger together. The first policeman looked over his shoulder at them, irritated by the whispering. They climbed a long flight of stairs, then entered a wide hall with a polished stone floor. By the shape and the height of the roof, Rini guessed that they were inside another one of the pyramids she had seen from the bus. A crowd of dark-haired people in various kinds of ceremonial dress, most of which featured capes similar to those the police wore, bustled in all directions. This multitude, full of hurry and self-obsessed energy, paid no particular attention to the prisoners. The only ones who showed any real interest were the half-dozen armed guards standing before the doors at the far end of the hall. These bulky men had animal helmets even more garishly realistic than those of the police, long antique-looking rifles and very functional-looking clubs, and seemed like they might enjoy the chance to hurt someone. As Rini and the others approached, there was an anticipatory straightening of the ranks, but after examining the policemen's emblems with great care, the guards reluctantly stepped aside and swung the doors open. Rini and her friends were pushed through, but their captors remained outside as the doors closed again. They were alone in a chamber almost as large as the hall they had just left. The stone walls were painted with scenes of fantastical battles between men and monsters. At the center of the room, in the pool of light cast by an electrified chandelier of wide and grotesque design, stood a long table surrounded by empty chairs. 
The farthest chair was considerably higher than the others, and had a canopy of what looked to be solid gold in the form of the sun's disk blazing through the clouds. The council is not here. I thought you might be interested to see the meeting place, though. A figure stepped from behind the massive chair, a tall youth with the same hawk-like features as the rest of the inhabitants. He was naked above the waist except for a long cloak of feathers, a necklace of beads and sharp teeth, and a high crown of gold studded with blue stones. Normally I am surrounded by minions. Numberless as the sands is how the priests put it, and they are nearly right. His accented English was softly spoken, but there was an unmistakable core of sharp, hard intelligence behind the cold eyes. If this man wanted something, he would get it. He was also clearly much older than he appeared. But there are quite a few other guests expected, so we shall need our space. And anyway, I thought it best to have our conversation in private. He showed a wintry smile. The priests would be apoplectic if they knew that the God King was alone with strangers. Who, who are you? Rini struggled to keep her voice steady, but the knowledge that she faced one of their persecutors made it impossible. The God King of this place, as I told you, the Lord of life and death. But if it will make you more comfortable, let me introduce myself properly. You are guests, after all. My name is Bolivar Atasco. Chapter 34. Butterfly and Emperor. Netfeed News. Refugee camp given nation status. Visual. Refugee city on Merida Beach. Voice over. The Mexican refugee encampment called the end of the road by its residents has been declared a country by the United Nations. Merida, a small city on the northern tip of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, has swollen to four million residents because of a series of killer storms along the coast and political instability in Honduras, Guatemala, and northeastern Mexico. Visual UN truck being driven through frenzied crowd. The three and a half million refugees are almost entirely without shelter and many are suffering from tuberculosis, typhoid, and Guantanamo fever. By making Merida a nation in its own right, the UN can now declare martial law and bring the new country under its direct jurisdiction. Jang, Orlando, you were right! You were right! Fredericks was leaping up and down on the beach, almost crazy with excitement and terror. Where are we? What happened? That's it. You were right. Orlando could feel sand beneath the palms of his hand, hot and gritty and undeniable. He scooped up a handful and let it pour away again. It was real. It was all real. And the city, wilder and more wonderful than anything in a fairy tale, the golden city was real too, stretching... Sorry, my pages are sticking together tonight. And the city, wilder and more wonderful than anything in a fairy tale, the golden city was real, too. Stretching almost as far as he could see, reaching toward the sky in a profusion of towers and pyramids as ornate as Russian Easter eggs. The thing that had haunted him was now just a few miles away, separated from him only by an expanse of blue ocean. He was sitting on a beach, an inarguable beach, staring at his own dream. And before that, he had passed through a nightmare. That darkness, and then that thing, that hungry, horrid thing. But it wasn't only a dream. There was something real behind it, like it was a puppet show, like... My mind was trying to make sense of something too big to understand. There was more wrong than just the nightmare. Wherever he was, he had not left the illnesses of his real body behind. The city stood in front of him, the couldn't-be city, the don't-dare-hope city, 
and yet he could barely force himself to care. He was melting like a candle, giving off too much heat. A big, hot something inside him was eating away at his thoughts, filling his head and pressing behind his eyes. Where are we? Fredericks was still jumping up and down in an ecstasy of uncertainty. As Orlando struggled to his feet, he realized that the Fredericks he was looking at was wearing the body of Pithlet, arch-thief of the Middle Country. That's wrong, he thought, but could not pursue it any farther. Standing up had only made him feel worse. The golden-daubed city suddenly tilted, and Orlando tried to follow it, but instead the sand jumped up to meet him, slamming against him as though it were one solid thing. As it, though it were one solid thing. Something in the dark touched me. The world was spinning, spinning. He closed his eyes and went away. Pithlet, the thief, was shaking him. Orlando's head felt like a rotten melon. At every wobble it seemed about to burst. Orlando? Frederick seemed to have no idea how much his voice was making Orlando's bones ache. Are you okay? Sick. Stop shaking me. Fredericks let go. Orlando rolled onto his side, hugging himself. He could feel the bright sun beating down on his skin, but it was a weather report from another part of the country. Deep inside him there was now a chill, resist a chill resistant to any sun, real or simulated. He felt the first shivers begin. You're shivering, Fredericks pointed out. Orlando gritted his teeth, lacking the strength even to be sarcastic. Are you cold? But it's hot. No, what does that matter? Sorry, man. We need to put something over you. All you're wearing is that loincloth. Fredericks looked around, scanning the empty tropical beach as though someone might have thoughtfully left a comforter behind one of the lava rocks. He turned back to Orlando as another thought struck him. Why are you in your Thargor sim? When did you put that on? Orlando could only groan. Fredericks knelt beside him. His eyes were still wide, pupils pinned like a lab animal given too much of something strong, but he was struggling his way back to some kind of logic. Here, you can have my cloak. He untied it and draped it around Orlando's shoulders. Beneath, he was wearing his character's usual gray shirt and breeches. But, hey, this is Pithlet's cloak. A am I Pithlet, like your Thargor? Orlando nodded weakly. But I never... This is skinny! Fredericks paused. Feel this. It feels real. Orlando, where are we? What happened? Is this somewhere on the net? Nobody on the net has equipment like this. He struggled to keep his teeth from chattering. The clicking made his head hurt even more. We're... I don't know where we are. But there's the city, just like you told me. Fredericks wore the look of a jaded child who has unexpectedly encountered the actual Santa Claus. That, that is the city you meant, right? He laughed a little shrilly. Of course it is. What, what else would it be? But where are we? Orlando was finding it difficult to keep track of Frederick's overstressed chattering. He wrapped the cloak tighter and lay down to ride out another wave of shivers. I think I have to sleep for a few minutes. Blackness reached out for him again, gathering him in. Orlando floated through fever dreams of stone tombs and Uncle Jingle singing and his mother searching through the halls of their house for something she had lost. Once he surfaced to feel Fredericks holding his hand. Think it's an island, his friend was saying. There's a temple or something made out of stones, but I don't think anyone uses it anymore, and, and that's about it. I couldn't get all the way to the other side because there's like an amazingly thick forest, well, more like a jungle, but I think because of the way the beaches curve, Orlando slid down again. As he bobbed in the buffeting currents of his illness, he snatched at the few thoughts swimming past, which seemed part of reality. The monkey children had wanted to take him to someone, an, an animal? 
an animal name, who knew about the Golden City. But instead, they had all been seized by something that had shaken him almost to pieces, as a dog grabs and dispatches a rat. A dog. Something about a dog. But now he was somewhere else, and the city was there, so he must be dreaming because the city was a dream thing. But Frederick's was in the dream, too. Another thought, cold and hard as a stone, dropped into his fevered mind. I'm dying. I'm in that horrible Crown Heights Medical Center, and I'm strapped onto a bunch of machines. The life is draining out of me, and all that's left is this one little part of my mind, making a whole world out of a few brain cells and a few memories. And Vivian and Conrad are probably sitting next to the bed, practicing their coping with grief skills, but they don't know. I'm still here. I'm still in here, trapped in the top floor of a burning building, and the flames are climbing up one story at a time, and all the firefighters are giving up and going home. I'm still in here. Orlando, wake up. You're having a bad dream or something. Wake up. I'm here. He opened his eyes. A gummy smear of pink and brown slowly became Frederick's. I'm dying. <coughs> For a moment, his friend looked frightened, but Orlando saw him push it down. No, you're not, Gardner. You've just got the flu or something. Oddly, Watching Fredericks decide to say something encouraging, despite the unlikeliness of it being true, made him feel better. Any hallucination in which Fredericks acted so much like Fredericks was pretty much as good as real life. Not that he seemed to have a lot of choice, anyway. The chills had subsided, at least for the moment. He sat up, still holding the cloak tightly around himself, his head felt like it had been boiled until his brains had turned to steam and hissed out. Did you say something about an island? Relieved, Frederick sat down next to him. With the oddly sharp focus of someone whose fever is in remission, Orlando noticed the brisk, bear-like clumsiness of his friend's movements. He certainly doesn't move like a girl. The actual fact of Frederick's sex was beginning to recede into the distance. For a moment, he wondered about what Frederick, Salome Fredericks, really looked like. Then he pushed the thought aside. Here, he looked like a boy. He moved like one. He said to treat him like one. Who is Orlando to argue? I think it is. An island, I mean. I was looking in case there was some way to get a boat. I thought I could even steal one, since I seem to be pithlet right now. But there's no one here but us. Fredericks had been staring out at the amusement park intricacy of the city just across the water, but now he turned back to Orlando. Why am I Pithlin anyway? What do you think is going on? Orlando shook his head. I don't know. I wish I did. Those kids were going to take us to meet someone. Then they said something about a big hole to somewhere and that they were going to hook us up. He shook his head again. It felt inordinately heavy. I just don't know. Pithlet waved his hand in front of his own face, frowning as he watched it. I've never heard of anywhere on the net like this. Everything moves just like in real life. And there are smells, everything. Look at the ocean. I know. So what do we do now? I say we build a raft. Orlando stared at the city. Seeing it so close, so actual, he had misgivings. How could anything that solid-looking live up to all the dreams he had invested in it? A, a raft? How are we going to do that? Did you bring your mess, Mr. Carpenter toolkit? Fredericks made a disgusted face. There's palm trees and vines and stuff. Your sword's lying right over there. We can do it. He scrambled across the sand and picked up the blade. Hey, this isn't Life Reaper. Orlando stared at the simple hilt, 
the bare blade so naked compared to Life Reaper's rune-scribed length. His burst of energy was wearing off, his thoughts dulling at the edges. It's my first sword, the one Thorgor, Thargor had when he first came into the Middle Country. He got Life Reaper just about a year before you came in. He looked down at his sandaled feet sticking out from beneath the cloak. I bet there isn't any gray in my hair either, is there? Fredericks examined him. No, I've never seen Thargor without a few streaks of gray. How did you know? He was feeling very tired again. Because these sandals, the sword... I'm the young Thargor. When he first came down from the Borakar Hills, he didn't get the gray hair until the first time he fought Dre Rajar down, at the, down in the, the Well of Souls. But why? Orlando shrugged and slowly lowered himself back to the ground, ready to surrender again to the soft tug of sleep. I don't know, Frederico. I don't know anything. He slid in and out of sleep as light turned into darkness. Once he was pulled almost completely to wakefulness by someone screaming, but the sound came from far away and might have been another dream. There was no sign of Fredericks. Orlando wondered dimly if his friend had gone off to investigate the noises, but his thoughts were clotted with fatigue and illness and nothing else seemed very important. It was light again. Someone was crying, and this noise was close by. It made Orlando's head hurt. He groaned and tried to fold his pillow over his ears, but his grasping fingers were full of sand. He pulled himself upright. Fredericks was kneeling a few feet away, face in hands, shoulders shaking. The morning was bright, the virtual beach and ocean made even sharper and more surreal by what was left of the night's fever. Fredericks? Are you all right? His friend looked up. Tears were streaming down the thief's face. The simulation had even reddened his cheeks, but most impressive of all was the haunted expression in his eyes. Oh, Gardner, we're so locked! Fredericks caught at a hitching breath. We are in bad, bad trouble. Orlando felt like a sack of wet cement. What are you talking about? We're trapped. We can't go offline. Orlando sighed and let himself slump back onto the ground. We're not trapped. Fredericks crawled swiftly across the intervening distance and grabbed his shoulder. Damn it, don't give me that. I went off, and it almost killed me. He had never heard his friend sound quite so upset. Killed you? I, I wanted to go offline. I was getting more and more worried about you, and I thought maybe your parents were out somewhere and didn't know you were sick, like you might need an ambulance or, or something. But when I tried, I couldn't unplug. I couldn't make any of the usual commands work, and I couldn't feel anything that isn't part of this simulation. Not my room, not anything. He reached up to his neck again, but this time more carefully. And there's no tea jack. Go on, you try. Orlando reached up to the spot where his own neuro cannula had been implanted. He could feel nothing but Thargor's heavy musculature. Yeah, you're right. But there, there are simulations like that. They just hide the control points and make the tactors lie. Didn't you go on Demon Playground with me once? You don't even have any limbs on that. You're just... Neural ganglia strapped into a rocket sled. Jesus, Gardner, you're not listening. I'm not guessing. I went offline. My parents pulled my jack out. And it hurt, Orlando. It hurt like nothing I've ever felt. Like they pulled my spine out with it. Like someone was sticking hot needles into my eyes. Like, like, like I can't even tell you. And it didn't stop. I couldn't do anything but scream and scream. Frederick stopped, shuddering, and could not speak again for a few moments. It didn't stop until my parents put the jack back in. I couldn't even talk to them. And 
Bang! I was back here. Orlando shook his head. Are you sure it wasn't just, I don't know, a really bad migraine or something? Fredericks made a noise of angry disgust. <clears throat> you don't know what you're talking about. And it happened again. Jesus, didn't you hear me screaming? They must have taken me to a hospital or something because the next time it came out, there were all these people standing around. I could hardly see it hurt so bad. The pain was even worse than before. The hospital gave me a shot, I think, and I don't remember much after that for a while, but here I am again. They must have had to plug me back in. Fredericks leaned forward and gripped Orlando's arm, his voice raggedly desperate. So you tell me, Mr. Golden City, what the hell kind of simulation acts like that? What have you gotten us into, Gardner? The hours of daylight and night that followed were the longest Orlando had ever spent. The fever returned in full strength. He lay thrashing in a shelter Fredericks had built from palm fronds, freezing and burning by turns. He thought his subconscious must be acting out Fredericks' story of escape and forced return, because at one point he heard his mother speaking to him, very clearly. She was telling him about something that had happened in the security estate, the community, as she called it, and what the other neighbors thought about it. She was prattling, he realized, in that very particular way she did when she was scared to death, and for a moment he wondered if he was dreaming at all. He could actually see her very faintly, as though she stood behind a gauze curtain, her face leaning in so close that it seemed distorted. He had certainly seen her that way often enough to make it a feature of a dream. She was saying something about what they were going to do when he got better. The desperation in her tone, the doubt behind the words, convinced him that dream or not, he should treat it as real. He tried to make himself speak, to bridge the impossible distance between them, Mired in whatever it was, hallucination or incomprehensible separation, he could barely force his throat to operate. How could he explain? And what could she do? Beazel, he tried to tell her. Bring Beazel. Bring Beazel. She fell away from him then, and whether it was only another phantasm of his febrile sleep or an actual moment of contact with his real life, it was gone. You're dreaming about that stupid bug, Fredericks growled, his own voice clumsy with sleep. Bug, he thought, dreaming about a bug. As he slid back into the dark waters of his illness, he remembered something he had read once about a butterfly, dreaming it was an emperor wondering if it were an emperor dreaming he was a butterfly, or something like that. So which is real, he wondered groggily. Which side of the line is the real one? A crippled, shriveled, dying kid in some hospital bed? Or a, a made-up barbarian looking for an imaginary city? Or what if... Someone completely different is dreaming both of them. All the children at school were talking about the house that burned down. It gave Christabel a funny feeling. Ophelia Weiner told her that a bunch of people got killed, which made her feel so sick she couldn't eat her lunch. Her teacher sent her home. No wonder you're feeling bad, honey. Her mother said, a hand on Christabel's forehead, checking for a temperature. Up all night like that, and then having to listen to all the kids telling stories about people dying. She turned to Christabel's father, who was on his way to the den. She's such a sensitive child, I swear. Daddy only grunted. No one got killed, honey, her mother assured her. Only one house burned, and I don't think there was anyone in it. As her mother went off to wave her some soup, Christabel wandered into the den where her father was talking with his friend, Captain Parkins. Her father told her to go outside and play, 
as if she hadn't been sent home from school sick. She sat down in the hall to play with her Prince pick a -Pick doll. Daddy seemed very grumbly. She wondered why he and Captain Parkins weren't at their office, and wondered if it had anything to do with that big, bad, secret thing that had happened last night. Would he find out what she had done? If he did, she would probably get punished forever. She pulled Prince pick a -Pick out of the nest of pillows she'd made for him. The otter doll tended to scramble toward dark, shadowy places and scooted closer to the door of the den. She put her ear against the crack to see if she could hear anything. Christabel had never done that before. She felt like she was in a cartoon show. A real goddamn mess, Daddy's friend was saying. After all this time, though, who'd have guessed? Yeah, said her father. And that's one of the biggest questions, isn't it? Why now? Why not fifteen years ago when we moved him to the last moved him the last time? I just don't get it, Ron. You didn't turn him down for one of his weird requisitions, did you? Piss him off? Christabel didn't understand all the words, but she was pretty sure they were talking about what had happened at Mr. Sellers' house last night, all right. She had heard her daddy on the phone in the morning before she went to school, talking about the explosion and fire. Gotta give the bastard credit, though. Captain Parkins laughed, but it was an angry laugh. I don't know how he managed to pull it all off, but he damn near fooled us. Christabel's hand tightened on Prince pick a -Pick. The doll let out a warning squeak. If the car had burned just a little longer, Captain Parkins went on, we wouldn't have been able to tell the difference between the stuff he left on the seat and genuine cremated cellars. Ash, fat organic waste, he must have if measured it out with a teaspoon to get the proportions right. Clever little bastard. We would have found the holes in the fences, said Christabel's daddy. Yeah, but later rather than sooner. He might have had an extra 24 hours head start. Christabel heard her father get up. For a second she was scared, but then she heard him begin to walk back and forth like he did when he was on the phone. Maybe, but shit, Ron, that still doesn't explain how he got away from the base in the time he had. He was in a wheelchair, for God's sake. MPs are checking everything. Could be someone just felt sorry for him and gave him a lift, or he might have just rolled down the hill and he's hiding out in the squatter town. Nobody knows anything will keep their mouths shut once we finish rousting the place. Someone will come forward. Unless he had a confederate. Someone who helped him get out of the area entirely. Where would he find someone like that? Inside the base? That's a court-martial offense, Mike. And he doesn't know anyone off the base. We monitor all his household contacts, outgoing calls. He doesn't even access the net. Everything else is harmless. We watched him real close. Chess by mail arrangement with some retired guy, retired guy in Australia. Yes, we checked it out carefully. Few catalog requests and magazine subscriptions, things like that. Well, I still don't believe he could have pulled it off without any outside assistance. Someone must have helped him. And when I find out who it is, well, that person's going to make to wish he was never born. Something was making a thumping noise. Christabel looked up. Prince pick a -Pick had crawled away under the hall table, and now the otter doll was bumping over and over against the table leg. The vase was going to fall over any second, and Daddy was, would hear that for sure and come out really angry. As she scrambled after the runaway otter, eyes wide and heart beating fast, her mother came around the corner and almost tripped over her. Christabel shrieked. Mike, I wish you'd take some time to talk with your daughter, her mother called through the closed door of the den. Tell her that everything's all right. This poor little girl is a nervous wreck. Christabel had her soup in bed. In the middle of the night, Christabel woke up scared. Mr. Sellers had told her to put on the new storybook sunglasses after school, but she hadn't done it. She had forgotten because she came home early. She slid down onto the floor as quietly as she could and climbed under the bed where she had hid them. She had taken the old pair with her to school and thrown them into the trash door just outside the classroom during the recess, just like Mr. Sellers had told her to. 
Being under the bed was like being in the cave of the winds in Otterland. For a moment, she wondered if there really was any place like that. But since there weren't any otters left that didn't live in zoos, her daddy had told her that. There probably wasn't a cave of the winds anymore. The sunglasses weren't blinking or anything. She put them on, but there was no writing, which made her even more scared. Had something happened to Mr. Sellers down there under the ground when the house blew up? Maybe he was hurt and lost down in those tunnels. Her finger touched the switch. The sunglasses still did not turn on, but just as she was thinking they might be broken, someone said, Christabel? Very quiet in her ear. She jumped and banged her head against the underside of the bed. When she dared, she took her off the sunglasses and stuck her head out, but even with the dark all over, she could tell that there was no one in the room. She put the glasses back on. Christabel? the voice said again. Is that you? It was Mr. Sellers, she suddenly realized, talking to her through the sunglasses. Yes, it's me, she whispered. Suddenly she could see him, sitting in his chair. Light was shining on only one half of his runny-looking face, so he looked even more scary than usual, but she was happy to see that he wasn't hurt or dead. I'm sorry I didn't put them on before, she began. Hush, don't fret. Everything is all right. Now, from here on, when you want to talk to me, you must put the glasses on and say the word. Oh, let me see. He frowned. Why don't you pick a word, little Christabel? Any word you want, but not one that people say very often. She thought hard. What was the name of that little man in the story, she whispered. The name the girl was supposed to guess. Mr. Sellers slowly began to smile. Rumpelstiltskin? That's very good, Christabel, very good. Say it yourself so I can code it in. There. And you can use it to call me every day after school. Maybe on your way home when you're by yourself. I have some very difficult things to do now, Christabel. Maybe the most important things I've ever done. Are you going to blow more things up? Goodness, I hope not. Were you very frightened? I heard the noise. You did an excellent job, my dear. You are a very, very brave girl, and you would make a wonderful revolutionary. He smiled another of his raggedy smiles. No, nothing else is going to blow up, but I'll still need your help from time to time. A lot of people are going to be looking for me. I know, my daddy was talking about you with Captain Parkins. She told him what she could remember. Well, I have no complaints then, said Mr. Sellers. And you, young lady, should go back to sleep. Call me tomorrow. Remember, just put on the glasses and say, Rumpelstiltskin. When the funny old man was gone, Christabel took off the storybook sunglasses and crawled out from under the bed. Now that she knew Mr. Sellers was okay, she suddenly felt very sleepy. She was just climbing back under the covers when she saw the face peering in through her window. It was a face, Mommy! I saw it! right there. Her mother pulled her close and rubbed her head. Mommy smelled of lotion, like she always did at night. I think it was probably just a bad dream, baby. Your daddy checked, and there's no one outside. Christabel shook her head and buried her face against her mother's chest. Even though the curtains were drawn, she didn't want to look at that window anymore. Maybe you'd better come and sleep with us, Christabel's mother sighed. Poor little thing. That house burning down last night really frightened you, didn't it? Well, don't worry, honey. It's nothing to do with you, and it's all over now. And I'm going to start there because the next section is just about to start. Ouch. And no sense in starting another section with one minute left to go. So, with that, um, I will...
have a look and continue to see what I'm doing with all the um, sound equipment and stuff like that. Um, as I said, it may just be, maybe just everything needs to be cleaned, but maybe, who knows, it's something much more mysterious and strange. Maybe the other is cutting in on the broadcast and the interference is being caused by that. Um, when we first started our, um, when we first started our uh, Shadow March bulletin board, we had a ghost. We had an official ghost on the bulletin board named Reg. Um, which I'll tell you about sometime, but I don't really have time to do so now. So who knows? Maybe it's the return of Reg. Um, anything's possible. Uh, by the way, uh, anybody out there who is enough of a tad obscurantist that you have my original anthology called Rite, R-I-T-E. Um, I believe there's a story in there called the Confl Conflagration or the Great Conflagration at the, Squ at the Quiller's Mint. The Quiller's Mint, it was, of course, a bar in the, or a tavern in the Shadow March series, but it also became the name for the um, uh, online chat and, and uh, whatnot um, part of our website. But uh, the Quiller's Mint was, was uh, where the ghost of Reg first showed up when we put Shadow March online, the Shadow March website. And uh, so I wrote a short story in that wound up um, in that first anthology, which is called something like The Great Conflagration at the Quiller's Mint, which is the origin of Red, just in case you have that book around or have access to it and want to know what I'm talking about. I mean, as much as what I'm talking about ever makes sense, that's what I'm talking about. So anyway, possibly maybe our sound problems are caused by Reg, the return of Reg, or some other ghost. One never knows. Whoever said that the modern world would not still be haunted? Certainly not me. Anyway, with that, I thank you all for joining me, including the folks I didn't get a chance to say hello to, like Robert Houck, who showed up, and Cliff, as always, hello, Cliff. And all of you folks, lovely to see you, lovely to hear from you. Be good. I will be back next Sunday at 1 a.m. and then again this slot at 7 p.m. So same Tad Times, same Tad Channel. Thank you so much for joining me. Be good to yourself. Be good to your friends and loved ones, uh, family, neighbors, all of that. Let's be good to each other. And uh, the only thing that can come out of that is more good. So, and God knows the world needs more good. So y'all take care and I will see you very soon. Peace.